right, good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. We're so excited to celebrate this wonderful day in the church year together. And um, we have lots of amazing things planned for this service. Uh, if you're new around here, a special welcome to you. And please be sure to visit our information booth in the back there on your way out so that we can connect with you and learn more about you and you can learn more about us. And yesterday we had an awesome egg hunt. And to tell you more about that and to announce some winners, we have the fabulous Ainsley. Thank you to everybody for coming to yesterday's Easter egg hunt. We had so much fun with bouncy slides, cookie decorating, crafts, and let's not forget about Jesus. Let's announce the raffle winners. For the kids' jelly beans, and the winner of a $10 ice cream social gift card is Ryder, with a guess of 668. There were 681 jelly beans in the jar. Adults Hershey Kisses and a $25 Met Market gift card. The winner is Leilani Hayes with a guess of one. She guessed there were 137. There were 147 in the jar. Ryder and Leilani, if you are here, come get your prizes.
help all of you echo. Sing a little louder. We'll get louder and louder, okay? church. Lord Jesus, you told us not to be discouraged. So whatever you're carrying right now, I want you to lay it all down. Help us keep our eyes on you because you are enough. In Jesus name.
Philippians tells us, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Jehovah Jireh means God will provide. Say it with me, church. God will provide. One more time. God will provide. Let's remember his faithful provisions in our lives. chosen. I know who I am, and I know what you've spoken, and I want you guys to sing that so everybody outside can hear you. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen.
of something that you're just trying to make right. Our breathing room is found in him. Go to him in repentance. Receive his forgiveness. are wide open. Please make us ready to receive your word today, Lord. Speak to each of our hearts and what we need to hear. And let us receive it with joy, Lord, with humility, with repentance. We ask this in Jesus' name. as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. As we sang those words, the letting go, we know that as Jesus hung on the cross, he let go of everything, right? He emptied himself for us. I was just in Nashville for a week at a prayer and worship conference. And the myriad of churches that gathered in the midst of turmoil, chaos, confusion, brokenness, the response of the church was to pray and to worship our risen Lord. That was the response of the church. We've seen on the news and on TV and in, in social media, why not, that there's another response for those that are found without a hope within them. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, we have a hope that surpasses all understanding, that surpasses all kingdoms from age to age in Jesus' name. So we use this time every week. If you're brand new, this is something that we do every single week. Some do it daily. We take communion, Holy Communion. So as you see in the front here, we have stations where you can kneel, where we ask you to kneel to receive communion. As Dan said last week, if you find an opening, so we, we fill from the beginning on, on out. From the, if you find an opening, shoot the gap, right? Fill it in, fill it in, just like, just like a running back. Boom, you're gonna go right through, right? Fill, fill in every single space, fill in every single space. Just like Jesus, who filled in every single space on that cross for you, for us. We remember, in the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks. He broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. This is my blood. The cup represents the new covenant. We look at covenantal language. This is the promise that God makes with himself, with his father, which can't be broken. He said, this is my blood. Take and drink. It's been spilled for this forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please come forward and receive communion. just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you and I'm sorry when I've come Nothing else, nothing else. 
church. Amen. So one of my favorite movies is uh, stars Will Smith when he plays Muhammad Ali, which I'm sure Will Smith loved playing that role because now he doesn't get to slap people, he gets to punch people. But one of my favorite scenes is when uh, Muhammad Ali is now no longer the heavyweight champ of the world. And this is all a true story. And George Foreman, who is the champ, and he's just destroying people. And in the weeks leading up to the fight, it shows this scene, which I think is historical. Some of you who've studied this would have to tell me, who've researched it. Muhammad Ali comes into the midst of George Foreman's training camp, well, Foreman's training, which is quite brash and audacious, right? And he shows up at his training camp and he starts pounding the drum. He goes, <laughs> he pounds the drum and he says, the champ is here. The champ is here, and he's not the champ, but he, and he, keeps, he keeps just beating the drum like that. I shouldn't be doing this, but, <laughs> and he keeps saying, the champ is here. And as you know, the fight uh, that ensues, uh, it's called the rope-a-dope. <laughs> it's one of my favorite scenes where Ali keeps pretending like he's about ready to get knocked out and it goes on. I can't remember how many rounds this goes on for. He's hardly punching back and he's looking to just punch Foreman out, right? So he gets tired. Those of you who box know punch, that takes it out of you. And I think it's like in the 10th round, finally they're tied up and Muhammad Ali whispers to George Foreman. He says, is that all you got, George? 
after 10 rounds of punching, and Foreman later recollected he, he thought about that question as they're tied up in the middle of the ring, and he goes, thought to myself, yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and he went on to lose, and Ali won the title. The reason I bring that up is I mentioned, he comes in and he says, the, the champ is here. This is the Sunday where we realize the king is here. The king has come now. Jesus, in this Palm Sunday, you realize now that the king has now arrived for the climactic battle. No more healing someone, and then Jesus says, don't tell anyone, which he does throughout his ministry. The scholars call this the messianic secret. Still don't quite know what to make of it outside of the fact that Jesus, when he healed someone, he didn't want people to go spread the word about him because he still had ministry to do, and he thought if the word got too, too, spread too far and wide, that that would impede that. Now, just before Matthew 21, the passage that's in your seat, don't look at it. Uh, the, d Jesus heals two blind men and on the road coming into Jerusalem. And they say, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Lord, son of David. And he asks, Jesus always asks weird questions. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And it's like, uh, <laughs> I'm blind. And he heals them. And then he doesn't tell them to be quiet. They start to shout and follow him. And then Jesus has this, basically, this parade going into Jerusalem. Now the secret is over. Now the king is coming into the midst of Jerusalem for the final climactic battle. And that's what I want us to look at today. Where's my, who stole my Bible? Uh, here it is. Jesus stole my Bible. All right. Matthew 21, verse 1. It says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied, tied there with a colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. This is Zechariah now. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and humble, riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed him, them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds then went ahead of him, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna is a, is a word for the people then that meant save, save, save. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. First thing, I want to look at four things today. I'll be quick. The first thing is that I want to take a look at the crowd. Because the crowd that was greeting Jesus exuberantly, I'm sure at least some of them, or in a majority of them, were present five days later when they were saying in front of Pontius, Pontius Pilate's palace, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It gives us a little bit of an indication of the type of crowd that we are. John MacArthur, he's a Christian pastor, he says, consistency is one of the most underrated words in, words in the dictionary. And that's, I think, what we find with American Christianity is that there's many Sundays when we could say, Hosanna. Praise be to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then five days later, we're sideways again. Spiritually flaky is what I'm calling this. Is that, yay, and then five minutes later, eh. See, see, what, see what type of crowd that we are? That's an indication of us spiritually, of who, who we are as, as we relate to God. We're flaky. It's not that we're dismissive of Christianity, although some are pretty antagonistic. It's that we're just sort of blah about it. And this is what, what C.S. Lewis said in the book, The Screwtape Letters. What the devil said in The Screwtape Letters is, listen to this. He, he said, if you're patient, this is the devil talking to his, his, his apprentice. He says, listen, Wormwood, if your patient is going to church, it's not a problem. He says, just when he's in church, you've heard me quote this, just get him to focus on the squeakiness of the shoes of the person behind him. 
or maybe if the sound system goes awry, or if the pa- what the pastor's wearing. He's not wearing a cool Hawaiian shirt like me, but nonetheless, if it's the pa- look at maybe how he's disheveled or how his voice is, is too high or too low. The devil says, get him to focus on those things. It doesn't matter then if he's sitting in church on a Sunday, as long as he could focus on something other than what the central presence of God is looking for that Sunday, focusing on Jesus Christ, focusing on his love. As long as you could get him to focus on those peripherals, he's ours. Your man is ours. There are many, he said, who have sat week to week in the pews of the enemy, which the devil refers to as God. There's many who've sat in the pews of the enemy week after week who now rest securely in our Father's kingdom below. Because you must remember, my dear Wormwood, a moderated religion a moderated faith in Jesus, a moderate one that's kind of center right, center left in the milk toasty middle, a moderated religion, the devil says, is as good for us as no faith at all. And he says, and you know what else? Not only is it as good as no faith at all, for us down here, he says, a moderated religion is infinitely more entertaining to watch because it's so flaky and so milk toasty. This is why my friend Isaac, when I was uh, at seminary, he was a pastor in Tanzania. He always said, Dan, uh, I pray for you guys. You know what he prayed for? He, he told us this, and I've heard a number of African pastors say this from time to time, where Isaac told me, he says, in America, you know what I pray for for you guys? I pray for persecution. You may say, what? Yes, I pray for persecution, he says, because then the sleepy Christians are going to wake up. No one's going to be persecuted for a mod- something that they moderately believe in, right? You'll just deny right away because it's, it's moderate to you. I can take it or leave it. But when persecution comes, those who, are, who want to cling in faith to the Lord, those who love Jesus, they're going to undergo it. And he says, I hope that happens to you guys in America. And I don't know if we're too far off anyway. So look at the crowd first. Secondly, I want you to see this. The second thing, look at what it says in, the, in, in Zechariah, verse 3. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king. That's the first thing, your king. This is not just another prophet. This is not just another Tony Robbins. This is not another guru to tell you how to live your life correctly. Your king is here. And what does it mean to have a king? It means, first and foremost, you're not him. That, look at uh, Jonathan Edwards, a famous uh, theologian pastor in, in the 18th century, he used to say, what's, he defined the essence of sin as the servant wanting to put themselves in the place of the king. You could read Genesis 3 and that's pretty clear. It's the servants who want to put themselves in the place of the king. I'm, I want to rule my life. I want to be the master of my own destiny. I don't want someone, nobody tells me what to do. I'm my own master. I know what's best for me. And I don't need this and I don't need that. I always thought when people say that they don't believe in God or need God, they're completely sufficient and content in and of themselves. That's an incredibly hubristic and prideful thing to say. I'm perfect the way I am. I don't need anything. I don't need help from above. I don't need any. It's incredibly hubristic. Jonathan Edwards says that's the essence of sin is that the servant puts themselves, themselves in the place of the king. Conversely, he says, what salvation? Salvation, if the, if the, if the sickness is the servant putting himself in the place of the king, he says salvation is the king putting himself in the place of the servant. That's amazing to me. It's the, it's the king taking everything that the servant was due in his rebellion. It's the king going under the punishment. It's the king going under the suffering. It's the king going under the wrath. That's the essence of Christianity. The essence of our problem is we want to be the king. And no, no, no. Palm Sunday says, the king is here. And go out now and tell everyone you want that the king is here. You don't have to hide it because Jesus says, my hour is now come. It's time for a cataclysmic event to take place. A great strife, Luke Martin Luther called it. A great battle. And it's going to be a battle unlike anything you've ever seen. Because, of, well, look at the second thing. See, daughter Zion, your king Well, the first thing we looked at the crowd. Second thing is the king, which we're not. And the third thing is the king comes. That's the type of God that we have. A God who would make you comfortable in your moderated religion is one who doesn't come. He waits for you to come to him. 
He waits for you to polish yourself and to clean up yourself and to wear the right clothes and to get your spiritual act in order, to get your spiritual resume all perfect, your T's crossed and your I's dotted. That's not Christianity. Your king is not waiting for you to clean up. Your king is coming to you. See, daughter Zion, your king comes to you. The Bible says that, the, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, that while we were yet sinners, uh, look at all we like sheep had gone astray and had turned to our own ways. What does that mean? We weren't turned toward him. We didn't want him. We weren't seeking him. Why? Because we want to be king. We want the things that we want. I want to live the way I want to live. I want to have the things that my heart desires. I want to be in this relationship. I want to do... <sighs> We had turned to our own ways and had turned our back on him. And, Jesus, and the Apostle Paul says, while we were like that, not when we were cleaned up, not when we had our nice bow tie on, not when we were v feeling very religious, no, when we wanted nothing to do with him, while we were like that, it says, Jesus Christ came and died for us. When no one wanted him. Oh, it appears they do on Palm Sunday, doesn't it? But remember, we're fickle. And we thought that he was coming to rid us of our temporary yoke of slavery. They didn't get it even when Jesus would heal a paralytic. And the first thing that he would heal in the paralytic is he would say, your sin is forgiven. There's a deeper paralysis that's going on in our hearts. That many of you don't want, like my teacher, that we don't want to admit. My teacher at seminary, Gerhard Ferdy, wrote a great book. Read it before you die. It's 120 pages. You can do it. It's called On Being a Theologian of the Cross. It's an excursus on Martin Luther's 1518, um, Luther's, Luther's thesis that he wrote at the, at the Heidelberg Disputation in 1518. And Ferdy likened the nature of sin as to that of addiction. And the thing about addiction is that in, 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 in the super lost stage of it, you don't want to admit that you're lost. Correct? You don't want to hear the truth. I could quit tomorrow, right? You don't, you don't want to hear who you really are. And that's why many of us, when Jesus comes, he parts the curtains and he says, my loving friends, my sons, my daughters, I want you to see. I want you to see. Why? Because until you see that, you will never see me. Your king is coming to you. Fourth or third thing. Look at, he says, see, daughter Zion, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, <laughs> gentle and riding on, humble. <laughs> Let me share a little bit of historical insight with you about how kings fought. Um, kings <laughs> did not go out to battle riding on an ass. I think we could all nod our heads in agreement to that. Because if you go out to battle riding a donkey, you're going to get killed. You'd be better on foot. But what is this telling us about Jesus Christ? Look at, I love this about Jesus because it's, just think about it. When you read the Gospels, you see the humility just oozing off the page. The humility of Jesus, how he, how he deigns to touch the leper, how he eats with tax collectors and sinners. There's not a bit of hubris or pride in this man. But conversely, there's not a shred of immodesty either, is there? He's humble, but he's not, immod he's not modest. Why? He, look at he's humble, he's with the tax collectors and the sinners, but then the next, in the next paragraph he's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That doesn't sound like a modest person. That there's salvation under no one else. You're going to look for peace and love and joy in all the wrong places, and you'll never find it outside of me. Does that sound like a modest person? No, it does not. Which is why most people get really, you've heard me say this before, they get really upset with the claims of Christianity. is because, well, here, like uh, Reynolds Price, uh, he was a writer and a professor at Duke University. Listen to what. Reynolds Price said about Jesus. He says, if 2,000 years of pious handling had not dimmed our understanding of the stories in the gospel of his demand, 
his gospel would still be seen as a burn, the burning outrage it continues to be. He's saying, look, at we've had 2,000 years to domesticate this message. I mean, we, you stand in church, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Do, 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 praise to you, O Christ. He's saying 2,000 years of that have cut the edge off, so to speak. It's become too familiar to us. And this is, this is a... Flannery O'Connor, she used to say, when you open up the Bible and read it, it should be a danger, TNT, you're opening up dynamite right now. Not a nice little religious ritual. And that's Reynold Price's point. He's a professor, of, was a professor of English at Duke University. He says, if 2,000 years of pious handling had not dimmed our understanding of these stories, his gospel message would still be seen as the burning outrage it continues to be. I love this. This sounds like C.S. Lewis, but it's not. It is either a work of madness or of blinding revelation. Listen to how you have to approach the claims of Jesus Christ. It's either a work of madness. Go read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's either the work of insanity or it's what? Blinding revelation, the truth about everything. The act it portrays, the claims it advances from the very first paragraph, demands that we make a hard choice. Let me read that again. The acts that the gospel narratives portray, the claims they advance from the very first paragraph demand that we must make a hard choice. And not say, well, that was nice, wasn't it? Guess what? Revival never happens. People never, sleepy Christians never wake up as long as church is nice. My teacher at seminary, Gerhard Ferdy, used to say, you want, you want the same reaction of people sitting in church and of the preacher that the crowd had when Jesus did something. They praised God. They were in awe. They hated him and wanted to kill him. That's always a reaction too, isn't it? Or they, they, fell, at their feet, they fell at his feet and they worshiped him. Those are the reactions you're going for. Never once did anyone encounter Jesus Christ for, I guess, there, you could maybe make a case for Luke 17, but never once did someone come to Jesus and walk away with healing or with a new heart and say, well, that was nice. Let's go. Do you want to go to Denny's? <laughs> Nothing against Denny's. I don't even know if there is a Denny's anymore. No, it's a weed shop now. You can't even find a Denny's on 6th Avenue. <laughs> Good night. Tells you a little bit about the culture that we're living in. Reynolds Price continues, if we take the gospel writers seriously, we must finally ask the question they thrust so fragrant, flagrantly upon us. Does the gospel writer bring us a life-transforming truth, or is this one gifted lunatic's tale of another lunatic wilder than he? Is this just one lunatic like the Apostle John? that tells us of a greater story of lunacy that's bigger than him? Or, or, you know what happened to Reynolds Price? He, interestingly enough, he had a, a pretty severe form of cancer. Get this, you guys. This is from an academician among all academicians. You know what I'm saying? Like, this isn't just from some Christian mystic. He, was hard, he wasn't even really a believer until this occurred. He had cancer, and I, I, he's at Duke, which is, I guess, nominally Methodist, but he had some friends that were praying for him, and he says, one night I had a dream. And you know some of those dreams, you guys, where it's, it's not like, you know, like, where, what the heck does that mean? And you're like uh, sitting next to a clown on a Ferris wheel at the Puyallup Fair eating cotton candy. You're like, I don't know. I just had the weirdest dreams. No, one that is lucid and seems like you, you could snap your fingers and wake up and it'd still be there. Real. He said, I had this dream. He said, I woke up and I was there at the Sea of Galilee. And he says, and everyone was asleep except me. And he says, all of a sudden there appeared Jesus Christ. And he's dying of cancer at this point. And Jesus says, follow me. And he says, and they walked out into the water. And Jesus puts his hands on him. And he said, son, your sin is forgiven. And then Jesus walked away. 
And Reynolds Price goes, but, but, but what about my cancer? What about my cancer? And as Jesus is walking, Reynolds Price said in his dream, he stopped and looked back at Price and said, that too, and walked off. He wakes up in the coming months and sees that he, he had a terminal disease and it was gone. But do you see what Jesus did? It's like lifted right out of the Gospels. I'm after the real cancer, Reynolds. Reynolds. I'm not, to be sure, I hate all disease, but I'm after the disease that gives life to every other disease. You think I'm here from the, for the Romans, which is a big enemy for you. I'm after the biggest enemy in the whole cosmos. I'm after death. I'm after sin. I'm going for the real tumor. And that's, that's Reynold Price's his, his, his point. Behold, your king comes to you humble. What a beautiful king he is. And all great kings are like that, aren't they? They're humble. They're the first one to weep. They're the first one to see injustice and have a steely-eyed resolve to, to go after it. They're the first one to see the enemy, the, the true king, and to charge out after it. And they're the first one take the hand of a child and pick them up and kiss them. That's a real king, isn't it? And that's what's, But the problem is, we don't have kings like that. Shakespeare kind of portrays it, I guess, but if you really want to see what Henry V is like, you'll realize he slaughtered lots of people. He looks good in Shakespeare. He looks like a, the king that everyone wants. He looks like he's humble and yet and, and have not a shred of modesty and be brave. He's the bravest one, but he's also the humblest one. Because some of you want to be super brave, super brave, super powerful. That's tyranny without humility. And some of you are so super humble, super humble, but you're not brave. That's a coward. So there's, you can have a king who's a coward, or you can have a king who's a tyrant. And you want to go throughout history, go, go search history for the hundreds and thousands and millions of years. Most of them have been unbelievable tyrants. Where, so why do we have this longing for the real king? It's because J.R. Tolkien was right. He said, when G, the true king came, he left a memory trace on all of our hearts. That, that's what, that our hearts truly are pining and longing for is that real king to be in our lives. That real king who is so humble that he'll kiss us on the cheek and wipe away all our tears, and the same king who will charge right at the biggest enemies and, and slay them and tear them apart. That's the real king, and we've never had one, but we have. He's come. See, daughter of Zion of Jerusalem, look, your king comes to you humble and gentle, riding on a donkey. Edward Shilato, I love this poem. You should memorize it. The great Japanese poet, he speaks a prayer to Jesus and he says, the other kings were strong, but thou wast weak. The other kings did ride on their steed, he says, but you stumbled to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And no other God has wounds He's powerful and mighty. The book of Hebrews calls him the Archegos, the champion. He will fight everything that needs to be fighting for you and knock it out and rip it to shreds. And then in the next instance, he's going to turn to you and put his hand underneath your chin and his, arms around, and his arms around you and lift you up and hug you and kiss you and give you a peace that passes all understanding. Look at this king. It's unreal. Look at on the cross. We're in Holy Week. I hope you come Good Friday. But on the cross, here is infinite power. Infinite. What does infinite mean? It doesn't have a, it's non-finite. Finite means it has an end. This has infinite, he has infinite power and he's being mocked and spit upon and he, he hangs there and stays. What is that? That is true power because look at how God's defining true power. I'm going to win through weakness. I'm going to win through powerlessness. And then when I come out of that tomb on Easter Sunday, you're going to see that, that, that vic what happened on that cross was not a defeat. Gerhard Ferdy, my teacher, said this in the book that I recommended to you that you need to reread before you die. Ferdy says, 
The cross is God's first attack on everything that seeks to bring you alienation, depression, anxiety, and hurt and pain. It's an attack. It looks like he's not doing anything. He's just hanging there. Is Jesus just hanging there? No, you guys. He is putting massive amounts of rounds down range right there. He is cutting the enemy's head off there. He's on the attack. He's on the move. He's not passive. That's why he's not to be pitied when he's on the cross. He's winning, you guys. He's not losing. He's winning. Your king has come to you. Powerful king, gentle, humble, riding on the foal of a donkey with his eyes fixed towards the cross. He's not losing. It looks like it is. You want to know why? Because we're so worldly conditioned. It looks like losing. He's not. He's winning. And here's the beautiful thing. It's the most oft-repeated promise after Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The most oft-repeated promise in the New Testament is that as Christ has been raised from the dead, you will be raised with him. I never get fatigued of saying that. It occurs almost 30 times in the New Testament. Because when you look at Jesus Christ's victory as he emerges from the tomb, the undead Jesus Christ, never to die again, the direct result is, now you have a victory. You people who have sucked your whole life, you've never, you got cut from the tennis team, you never, you never were the, the, champ, the, the popular cheerleader, you, you're, you didn't have a successful job, you married the wrong person, life sucked, you, you're, maybe you're struggling in the pangs of addiction or in a lifestyle that you wish you could liberate for. I got news. That man rose from the tomb on Easter Sunday. Now you have a victory. You've never had a victory in your life. You got one now. And not only do you have one, you have the only, victory that, the, the only victory that matters in the end. You have the final scoreboard. And if Jesus Christ says, I won, and now because I won, you win. That means that death can't have you, sin can't have you, grief can't have you. I'm going to wipe all tears away from your, everyone's eyes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of all grief and pain and suffering. Those things are going to be no more. They can't have you. You get my victory. You don't get your own victory. Let's just be clear. You get his victory. Why would you want your own victory? Good night. What have you ever done for yourself except bring yourself misery for crying out loud? When you're just operating under your own mindset and operating over this is what I want, this is what feels good. Yeah, good luck with that. The whole history of the Bible is rife. We just finished up the book of Judges. When every man does what is right, every man and woman, there is no king in Israel and everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Yeah, good luck with that. You get rape, murder, genocide, tyranny, kidnapping. Just to clarify the record, none of those are good. But if you yield to him, and the tr wouldn't you want to yield to a king who is powerful enough to eradicate every powerful enemy in this cosmos just by, just like that, and who is so tender that he would go up to a leper who you weren't supposed to touch unless you contract the disease, and he puts his hands on him. Or goes to a dead body, a little girl, and he takes her by the hand, and he says, my beautiful sweetheart, Talitha Kum, little girl, get up. That doesn't look like a king. You know why? Because that's worldly conditioning. That's what the true king looks like. Everyone else is a doggone imposter. And there's lots of kings that vie for the attention and the devotion of your heart. They're imposters. They're fakes. They're, they're pseudo-kings. And the real king, this is why it's so important that he's come. And he says, I'm not after necessarily your money. I'm not after your time. I'm not after your things. I'm not even after necessarily your devotion on Sunday morning. All those things I, I'm after secondarily. But right now, I'm after your heart. And until I get your heart, none of that other stuff matters. I'm after your heart. That's what he's after. Think about it this way. We got to go. I know. Shut up. Um, think about it this way. Let's just imagine there is a God. Okay? So this is a thought experiment. Let's just imagine there is a God. Okay, got it. Now let's imagine that there is a God who's not distantly, distantly aloof, but who left everything that he has. The Bible says he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant who traveled an infinite distance at infinite cost and went into the most ungodly of places where God limited himself in a sense, right? And, and lost everything and did not, and, and, and died in complete abandonment and shame 
And you, then the question would be, well, why would such a God do that? That's the question. And then when he rose from the dead, the message of the New Testament is clear. He did that because he loves and wants you. Now, does that sound like the kind of God that's going to leave you alone? If he traveled that far at that level of cost, do you think he's just going to let you walk out of here and say, that's nice? He's after you. This is why some of the greatest Christian theologians have called him the hound of heaven. He's going to keep pursuing. He's going to keep coming after you. Stanley Hauerbos, we'll conclude with this. I got two things. Two things, okay? And guess what? Then we have more baptisms this Sunday. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> because I think, I think the Lord's starting to, with all the chaos in our country, the political chaos, the social chaos, our king is coming. Huh? Our king is coming. We play, pray, come Lord Jesus, but he could be, I think our king is starting something new. He's coming into the teeth of his enemies. Now I forgot the story I was going to tell you. Um, oh, last thing. I'll skip the, I'll go straight to the last one. And this summarizes the whole doggone deal. Now eyes up here and pay attention. There's a wonderful little story. I don't know how many of you have heard of it called Palm Monday. You heard of this? Anyone here heard of Palm Monday? It's the story from the donkey's perspective. There's a Christmas story about this called Nestor the Long Eared Donkey, but that's not what I'm talking about. You've seen that claymation show, which is awesome, around Christmas time, but that's more to do with Christmas. This is called Palm Monday, and the donkey carries Jesus into Jerusalem. And what is everyone doing? Woo! <laughs> They're cheering. <laughs> And everyone's, everyone's so exuberant. And so the donkey thinks he's like, oh, I'm a stud. I'm the, I'm the black stallion all of a sudden. I'm man of war. Seabiscuit just came into Jerusalem. Look at me. Look at me. And so this is called Palm Monday. And the next Monday, he comes out of his, his uh, barn door and he's all like, Sup? 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 Hey, hey, how you doing? Gotcha. And he comes out, and, he's, and he, he goes to the marketplace, and they're like, get out of here. St get this ass out of here, this donkey. And he's like, wait a minute. What happened? What happened? He says, well, maybe I'll go down by the temple where the real cheers were. So he goes down to the temple, and they're all like, get this stinky thing out of here. And they kick him. He gets out of here, and he, get him out of here. And he, he hobbles home, and he goes to his mom, he says, Mom, I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't get it. She says, son, foolish son, without him, you're nothing. If he's not writing you, you're nothing. What's the message? Without him, you guys, what are we? Yes, and if right now the Lord is moving, the God, the author of life, do you want more? Do you want more than just your four square years here? And, and we're gone and no one remembers you anymore three generations away. Do you want to just be dust in the wind as the great rock band Kansas sang? Or do, are you looking for someone who the, in him there is no change or decay? That there is no death. Do you want more? Do you want, Jesus says, I could give you life, life to the eternal because without him, my foolish child, nothing without him. And your king, beautifully enough, has come to you today. Humble, huh, riding on the foal of a donkey for you and for your salvation. So, Father, we love you and we, uh, we praise the name of Jesus today. We thank you that we have a king who's unlike any other king, who emptied himself who took on the form of a servant and was obedient to death, even death on the cross. And Father, in our mind's eye, as we pray to you now, as we look at your son hanging on the cross. Time out, let's just do that for a second in your mind's eye, guys. Just look at Jesus now hanging on the cross. And we see him cry out to you in abandonment, suffering under the weight of death and darkness and sin that place where such a mighty and beautiful heart was broken to save us all. 
Father, I pray that, I don't know, that some of us who have sat in pews for a billion years or just maybe this is your first Sunday back in church or wherever we are, I pray that you would just stick those hearts, Lord, that you are the ultimate burden taker and that, that we would uh, commit our lives to you in, 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 in all facets, Lord. And we thank you that we have a victory now. Those of us who have experienced loss after loss after loss after loss, we thank you, Jesus, that when we cling to your victory, we're undefeated. <laughs> Champions along with your champ, because you're the true champion. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We just give thanks um, for our pastor. Yeah. It's refreshing to hear the gospel every week, isn't it? Like the real gospel. Yeah, we need it, the strengthening. Well, I, we want to get straight to baptisms, but I just wanted to refresh everybody's mind. It's Holy Week starting tomorrow. Well, it's today, I guess, technically, right? So, Kim Shaw has put some effort into these newsletters. So if you're wondering what times and events are coming, they're at that Welcome Center. But I just wanted to remind everybody, Thursday we'll be doing what we're calling the Lord's Supper Thursday service at 6.30. And then Friday, a Good Friday service at 6.30. And then Sunday is a tricky Sunday because of the times are different than normal. They are going to be at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. So tell your friends, and if you have friends that you're inviting, let them know if they have kids at 10.30 is when we'll have Kids Church. Sound good? Also this Friday on Good Friday is our prayer burn from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. because those are the hours that Jesus was on the cross. And so there is still time to sign up. There is a whiteboard back there. Please feel free. Um, a 15-minute commitment is all we're asking for. In your seats, I know, I'm so sorry. We kind of pulled the trigger last minute. We put so many papers in your seat today, but on your seat, take it home with you. Do a little inventory of all the papers, but it is your Good Friday prayer burn, prayer target. So we all will be praying these three things. So some instructions are on there, so pay attention to that. Uh, one thing to note, the prayer room, we will have signage because a lot of you may not have been there. So I, when you come Friday, we'll have signage directing you where to go. Uh, there are stairs. So we'll have a backup plan. If you cannot do stairs, we can help people up the stairs. That's how much we care about it. So if you can come, we would love to have you here in person. If you can't, take the paper home with you and pray during those times. And can I share some good news from last week? I think you're going to like it. So I was standing over here, and then you guys were all over there, as you should have been, watching the baptisms. And I had a line of friends come up that wanted to be baptized. <laughs> and one of the, the first people I talked to, she got saved. She got saved last week. And John prayed with somebody, and they got saved. And then this morning... We have some kids that are going to be baptized, and they got saved. They confirmed that they do want Jesus in their life, and they acknowledge him. Revival's happening in our church. We're in it. We're in the river right now. We've got the fruit of the presence of God. People's hearts are being moved. So in that same way, John and I are going to be over here while you all are over there. If your heart is stirring, if your palms are sweaty, if your heart's racing right now, and you... I'm telling you, that means you're the one, you're up, okay? You're up. So whether you want to be baptized today, you haven't verbalized it, you want to say yes to Jesus, you want to do all of it, come over, don't be shy. John and I will be over here, and the rest of you, let's just enjoy the celebration. Amen? Amen. God bless you all.